we're back for another follow-on discussion. My guest has so far explained what she calls the lottery issue, and outlined why she thinks she would have a problem justifying to God a belief in, shall we say, conventional Christianity or Islam. Last week she gave a brief outline of her belief, and explained both why she didn't think the lottery issue applied to it, and how she thought she could justify her belief to an atheist. This week we'll be raising a few issues of our own, and this time, for her belief. Welcome. Thank you for having me back. Last week, you raised the question of whether the environmental objects, as you called them, were physical or in the mind of God. Yes. Well, what do you make of a comment made by the philosopher René Descartes when considering the idea that his experience was given by God or some intermediary? For God has given me no faculty at all for recognizing any such source for these ideas. On the contrary, he has given me a great propensity to believe that they are produced by corporeal things. So I do not see how God could be understood to be anything but a deceiver if the ideas were transmitted from a source other than corporeal things. It follows that corporeal things exist. To put that in the type of terminology you are using, Descartes is saying that if physical environmental objects aren't the source of the experiential objects you experience, then God is a deceiver. And since God is not a deceiver, it follows that the environmental objects are physical. What's your response to that? Firstly, we do have a faculty for recognizing that environmental objects might simply be in the mind of God. Reasoning. I outlined two arguments in our last discussion for expecting God to exist, the influence issue and the fine-tuning of the experience issue. And while you might say, well, they don't rule out the possibility of there being both a God and physical objects, once you understand that reality isn't a physical one with no gods, it is reasonably easy to understand that the existence of physical objects wouldn't offer any explanatory value. God would always know your will at all times, and the influence of that on the physical given the rules. So God would still have a model of it anyway. A person might try to argue that if the physical was made so as to give you the experience, then God wouldn't need to bother but God would already be in communication with you anyway to know your will. And it isn't clear to me that it would be any harder for God to communicate the experience to you while it is already in communication with you anyway. For example, I don't know whether it takes more effort to restrict what is communicated. Therefore, with no reason to expect a physical, why add one in when it would offer no explanatory value? It would just be a needless addition. And therefore, I can see a reason for expecting the environmental objects to be in the mind of God. Personally, I would be surprised if they weren't. Secondly, I don't think people are born with a propensity to believe their experience is produced by physical things. I think they have been brought up to think that they are. I do think they have a propensity to think of the experiential objects that they normally talk about, as though they were environmental objects but not a propensity to make a distinction between the experiential objects and the environmental objects. If beings like us were being given the experience of being other animals on this planet, I doubt the distinction would have come to their mind. But once you do start to reason about the situation, then yes, a distinction between experiential objects and environmental objects can be made. Only once that distinction has been made would you be in a position to consider the nature of the environmental objects. But once you do, as I've said, I can see a reason for expecting the environmental objects to be in the mind of God. My third point is that I think Descartes was blasphemous to suggest that if physical things weren't the source of his experience, that it would be more likely that God was a deceiver than it was that Descartes had made a mistake in his reasoning. And lastly, I accept that some people indoctrinated into thinking that the environmental objects were physical might have a problem believing they aren't. But I don't think that matters. I don't think believing they are physical will make any difference regarding whether a person gets into heaven or not. It is just that their being a physical wouldn't offer any explanatory value, and thus I wouldn't expect one. If there is, so what? It isn't fundamental to my belief that there isn't. It doesn't have any bearing on the issue of following the loving selfless path or not. Thank you for your response to Descartes' argument. You seem to have a reasonable defense. But nevertheless, would you agree that the biblical account in Genesis does describe a physical account? Well, the first verse of Genesis, the line which has the mathematical peculiarities we talked about when discussing the problems I currently have justifying believing that the Quran is 100% the word of God, that talks of God in the beginning creating the heavens and the earth. 
and that to me seems compatible with the idea of the heavens and earth being modeled in the mind of God. But the very next verse mentions the Spirit of God hovering over the surface of the waters, and that might seem to suggest the idea of waters being physical and not just in the mind of God, because the Spirit of God is given a location relative to the waters. But I don't think that need be the case. For example, one can imagine an account of God walking through the Garden of Eden and sitting under a tree, but the form could just be an avatar. And even though in Genesis 1 verse 2 God isn't given a form, you can imagine a game, for example, where you have a certain perspective and can move about, but don't have a form. But as I mentioned when describing my belief, I believe both God and Satan exist. What I didn't make clear was that I believe this room to be very special in the sense that the rules on how it will operate are agreed upon by God and Satan, and the rules would be equitable. Thus, the degree to which the rules allowed God to be able to insert thoughts that wouldn't normally be generated by the human operating with the usual rules would determine the degree to which Satan was allowed to do a similar thing. And if that was the case, then maybe a person initially inspired by God could very easily go wrong by subsequently going along with either inspirations from Satan or thoughts generated by their human under the usual rules. Thus, it seems possible to me that God might have inspired the first verse, but not the second. Though, as I've mentioned, the second verse need not be thought to be incompatible with the model being in the mind of God. And that is the reason I wouldn't agree that the Genesis account need be thought to be an account in which a physical world is thought to exist. I see. Well, no matter. Let's move on from the issue of whether God holding the environmental objects in its mind can be defended, as there are numerous other issues I'd like to discuss with you. I'd like to now move on to what I think is a more serious issue for what you have said about your belief in our last discussion. When outlining your belief, and I'm going to quote you here, you said, I believe that God exists, and that God is a loving, selfless God, and also that Satan exists. And we are experiencing this room, if you will, to choose whether to reject the loving selfless path or not. Do you stand by those words? Yes. And when you talk about choosing between whether to reject the loving selfless path or not, am I correct to assume that you're suggesting we have free will, in the sense that, when choosing between two options, both options are possible, before you choose which one happens? Yes. Well, I'd like to refer to Sam Harris's book, Free Will. I'd just like to read to you from it. It is quite a long extract, but hopefully it will convey the point. The physiologist Benjamin Libet famously used EEG to show that activity in the brain's motor cortex can be detected some 300 milliseconds before a person feels that he has decided to move. Another lab extended this work using functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. Subjects were asked to press one of two buttons while watching a clock, composed of a random sequence of letters appearing on a screen. They reported which letter was visible at the moment they decided to press one button or the other. The experimenters found two brain regions that contained information about which button the subjects would press a full 7 to 10 seconds before the decision was consciously made. More recently, direct recordings from the cortex showed that the activity of merely 256 neurons was sufficient to predict with 80% accuracy a person's decision to move 700 milliseconds before he became aware of it. Were you aware of these experiments? Yes. Well, let me just read on. These findings are difficult to reconcile with the sense that we are the conscious authors of our actions. One fact now seems indisputable. Some moments before you are aware of what you will do next, a time in which you subjectively appear to have complete freedom to behave however you please, your brain has already determined what you will do. You then become conscious of this decision and believe that you are in the process of making it. Would you like me to read it again? No, I think it's okay. Well, do you dispute what Sam Harris claims seems like an indisputable fact? Yes, and if you'd like, I'll run through those experiments. Please do. The first experiments he mentioned are the Labette experiments. From what you read out, Sam Harris claimed that brain activity was found in the motor cortex 300 milliseconds before the person felt that a decision to move had been made. In context, and given what he went on to say regarding his seemingly indisputable fact, that moments before you are aware of what you will do next, your brain has already determined what you will do. It seems that Sam Harris was trying to give the reader the impression that the brain activity detected in the Labette experiments was indicating that the brain had already determined the person was going to perform the action. 
that a reliable predictor of whether the person was going to perform the action had been discovered. I accept that I may have misread Sam Harris's intentions, but it isn't like no atheist has tried to give that impression. For example, the atheist philosopher Daniel Dennett did suggest such a thing regarding the Libet experiments. Let me just get the quote of what Daniel Dennett wrote in his book, Freedom Evolves. By the way, when Dennett mentions the RP, he is talking about the brain activity that was detected. It is known as the readiness potential. Here it is. Writing about the Libet experiments, Dennett wrote, There is no controversy about whether, in this artificial circumstance, the RP is the triggering cause of your flick. The RP is a highly reliable predictor of flicking. And I can understand how a person reading that might feel that the conclusion that we don't have free will is simply forced upon us by scientific fact and why you brought it up. The problem is that it isn't true that the RP was a highly reliable predictor of flicking. As the philosopher Alfred Melly pointed out in his 2010 article, Testing Free Will. I won't go through all the details here, but if your listeners are interested, they could check it out. Basically, the readiness potential or RP detected in the Libet experiments was the result of taking a few seconds of data before each movement and then averaging that data. The RP or readiness potential is a signal that emerges in that average data. Libet did not report that a similar signal was found before each movement and only before each movement and could therefore be thought of as a reliable indicator of a movement. As I mentioned, the data that was averaged was data taken from a few seconds before the person moved. There is no indicator of how many times similar activity might have occurred without the subject making the motion, because no movement, no record. Fortunately for us, further experiments have been done subsequent to Mele's article, and one paper describing such an experiment was published in 2015 under the title The Point of No Return in Vetoing Self-Initiated Movements. They used the same type of EEG readings that the Libet experiment used, but then used a computer to see if they could train the computer to be able to predict when the subject was going to press a button. Your listeners might be wondering whether the computer was able to find a signal which was a highly reliable indicator. The answer is no. The subjects were tasked against the computer. The subjects were to wait for the green light to come on and wait for about another two seconds before trying to press a button with their foot. If they managed to press the button with their foot before the computer turned the light red, then they would get a point. But if they pressed it after the computer had turned it red, they would lose one. Game scores aside, as the computer lost no points for turning the light red even when the subject wasn't going to press the button, if we just look at the experimental results for how well the computer did with its prediction, over 60% of the time, Either the person managed to press the button without the computer detecting that they were about to, or the computer predicted that the person was about to press the button, but the person didn't. And the equipment used to detect muscle movement didn't detect any. The reason I mentioned that the equipment didn't detect any muscle movement is that where the computer turned the light red, there were a substantial amount of cases where the person didn't press the button, but there was muscle movement detected. And when the experimenters did silent trials, where the computer didn't turn on the light, it seems as though those cases where there were muscle movements but no button presses would have been button presses had the subjects not noticed the light. But in those cases, there was muscle movement detected. Nevertheless, even if you were to count the cases where the computer turned on the light and muscle motion was detected, but the people didn't press the button as correct predictions, the computer still got it wrong over 60% of the time with either the people pressing the button without the computer predicting it, or the computer turning on the light without the people pressing the button and without any muscle motion being detected. Thus, the signals that it found were hardly a reliable indicator. Which brings us on to the next experiment that Harris mentioned, the one in which he claimed the experimenters found two brain regions that contained information about which button the subjects would press a full 7 to 10 seconds before they thought they made the decision. In the book, Harris gives the reference as a 2011 article by John Dylan Haynes called Decoding and Predicting Intentions. The experiment mentioned in that article was reported in 2008 in an article titled Unconscious Determinants of Free Decisions in the Human Brain. The only reason I mention it is that the earlier article also mentions that they tried to predict when the subjects would press the button, but they were correct less than 30% of the time. <laughs> 
The article, however, does report that experimenters found two brain regions containing information about which button the subjects would press a full 7 to 10 seconds before they thought they were making the decision. A reasonably important point that Sam Harris missed out, though, was that in predicting which button the subjects were going to press, they achieved around 60% accuracy, which, as the paper mentioned, was only 10% above chance. Given that a person could toss a coin and achieve roughly 50% accuracy, as there are only two buttons, the reason I think it is an important point is that given the context, the reader might have got the impression that by monitoring those areas of the brain, they could reliably tell which button the subjects were going to press. But that simply was not the case. And then there was the final experiment, which Harris claimed allowed them to predict with 80% accuracy a person's decision to move 700 milliseconds before they were aware of choosing to. The problem with it was they were encouraged to move when they felt the urge to do so. But it isn't the case that people just get the urge. They need to generate the urge in the first place. Otherwise, they would just be sitting there. And with this experiment, they were told to press the button when they feel the urge to do so. The task can therefore be looked at as to build up an urge, then press the button when the urge reaches a certain point. With the computer being able to detect with 80% accuracy when that point will be. It should also be noted that in this final experiment, the person wasn't trying to beat the machine. The experiment wasn't asking the subjects to make the free will choice whether to press the button or not whenever they get the urge to. The experiment is instructing them to go ahead and press it at such a point. But it does give potential for further experiments. You could have experiments where the subjects try to beat the machine, but there would be a risk that the subjects pre-prepared their decisions before they enacted them. One way of avoiding that would be to have the subjects presented with random tasks, which they have two seconds to perform, and let the computer make a prediction regarding what choice the subject will make, based on the subject's brain state before the task was revealed. Because as long as the tasks were sufficiently varied, the person wouldn't have already made up their mind what they were going to do. Otherwise, it potentially allows for the machine to read what decision the person has already made. For example, the person might try to fake a button press, but they would already know themselves that the button press was going to be a fake, and as the machines got better at reading the brain, they might read the intention reflected in the brain that the button press was going to be a fake. But if there wasn't free will, why wouldn't the brain reflect how they were going to react to a task even before they were shown it? Now, just to try to put these results into context regarding my belief, I believe that we are sometimes given the opportunity to make choices if options came to mind. If options do come to mind and I chose one, then God can read my will on the matter and make the appropriate changes to the brain state of my human form according to the agreed-upon rules. And as I understand it, the idea of options coming to mind giving rise to an occasion where I could make a choice cannot be claimed to be some ad hoc suggestion to cope with these experiments. Because as I understand it, this type of understanding was arrived at in philosophical thought in Europe as early as the 14th century, and possibly in Islamic thought as early as the 10th century, and that by the 17th century there were a number of philosophers in Europe not just recognizing the possibility of such a reality, but positively arguing for it. The type of experiment I described would seem to remove the possibility that the machine was simply reading what choices were made when earlier options came to mind where the person decided to fake the next button press, for example. But if the machines could make reliable predictions from the brain, how the person would react in the tasks before the person could have made any decisions about the task, then there wouldn't be any possibility that the machine was simply reading previous decisions regarding the task. And my viewpoint would be falsified. That it could be falsified arguably allows it to be considered as something other than a metaphysical viewpoint. Because it wouldn't be beyond scientific testing. Unlike the claim that environmental objects are physical rather than being modeled in the mind of God, for example. Okay, I'd like to stick with the idea of free will, as that is a key concept in your belief. But I'd now like to move on to the theory of relativity. With Newtonian physics, it was thought that what events were simultaneous could be measured and agreed upon, no matter what frame of reference the observer was in. But with Einstein's relativity, what events are simultaneous depends upon the frame of reference they are measured from. Do you accept that? I accept it, but I would also like to point out that with Newtonian physics, it was thought that absolute simultaneity could be measured. What relativity has shown is that it can't. And instead, any simultaneity that is measured 
would be relative to the frame of reference it was measured in. Since absolute simultaneity couldn't be measured, it was widely dropped as a concept from the scientific model, because the model was to only contain that which could be measured. Okay, I'm going to quote from Roger Penrose here. Even with quite slow relative velocities, significant differences in time ordering will occur for events at great distances. Imagine two people walking slowly past each other in the street. The events on the Andromeda Galaxy, the closest large galaxy to our Milky Way, some 20,000 quadrillion kilometers distant, judged by the two people to be simultaneous with the moment that they pass one another, could amount to a difference of several days. For one of the people, the space fleet launched with the intent to wipe out life on the planet Earth is already on its way, while for the other, the very decision about whether or not to launch that fleet has not yet been made. So I put it to you. How could the aliens that are about to make the decision in one frame of reference have free will, if in another frame of reference, the decision about what they are about to decide has already been made? Because what is being talked about is measured simultaneity. In other words, what is measured as being simultaneous? It is simply that the measurements will be different depending on the frame of reference they are measured from. The person walking in one direction would be in a different frame of reference from the person they are passing, and so would measure things differently. That isn't incompatible with the idea that only one time with the aliens in the Andromeda galaxy would be simultaneous with the event of the two people passing each other. The problem would just be that it wouldn't be possible to establish what that time was. Because while there could exist a frame of reference which would give the result correctly, there would be no experiment to establish which frame of reference that was. I hope your listeners don't misunderstand me. I understand the relativity framework just considers what can be measured. And because which frame is the correct one can't be measured, the concept of absolute time is done away with in the framework. And without the concept of absolute time in the theory, there is no concept of absolute simultaneity, and therefore no idea of one correct answer to the question which event with the aliens in the Andromeda galaxy was simultaneous to the people passing in the street. All the events which were measured as simultaneous were considered simultaneous. Einstein was very clear on the matter in his book. He stated that we required a definition of simultaneity which could be measured, and he encouraged the reader not to proceed further in his reading until the reader was fully convinced on that point. But you could have a definition of simultaneity which could not be measured, as you can still have the idea of absolute time. That while I am experiencing what I am experiencing, you are experiencing something else. While accepting that it cannot be measured, what you would be experiencing relative to what I am experiencing given the realization that our best efforts to measure what it was would yield different results, depending on the frame of reference they were measured from. With that viewpoint, and unsurprisingly that is the viewpoint I hold, God would know the answer, but the answer would be metaphysical in the sense that it could not be tested for within physics. But why would God choose to model the universe using equations which make it seem as though there is no absolute time? Though I can understand why you asked the question, because of the way relativity is talked about where the concept of the present is removed from scientific discussion because what is simultaneously in the present cannot be measured. But just because the concept of the present then becomes metaphysical in the sense that it cannot be measured in physics, it doesn't make it incompatible with the findings. As I understand it with the block universe model, often associated with the theory of relativity, I am thought to exist across time. That me an hour ago and two hours ago and three hours ago and a year ago all exist, and that works fine for the mathematical model. But my experience doesn't seem to me to correspond to what physically would be thought to exist in such a model. Because what I'm experiencing is changing. But as I understand it, nothing physical in the block universe model changes its space-time coordinates. And it seems natural to me to think of the simultaneity of the present. And as I've said, the equations of relativity are compatible with the metaphysical idea of the simultaneity of the present. It isn't like the equations forced a different understanding on us. It is simply that the metaphysical concept isn't used in the theory. For your listeners that are interested, I noticed that Mark Hinchcliffe produced a paper called A Defense of Presentism in a Relativistic Setting, which they could read if they wanted more detail. And regarding your question about why God would choose a model which offered some scope to attempt to deceive people about the free will issue, I suspect that this room is Satan's idea, and I wouldn't be surprised if the model was suggested by Satan. As I've explained, it doesn't imply no free will, but atheists might have been tempted to interpret it that way, 
because it would fit in with the idea that what we consciously experience doesn't influence our behavior. The behavior already being determined by unconscious processing. But as mentioned in our previous discussion, it was obvious that our experience does influence us, because we can tell from it that at least part of reality is experiencing. And so any metaphysical outlook which suggests it doesn't, is obviously wrong. Okay, let's move on to the philosophical arguments. What about the argument that for you to be morally responsible for a choice you make, you would have to be morally responsible for the state of mind you had when you made it? And to be responsible for that, you would have to have been morally responsible for the choices that led to it, which in turn would mean you would have had to have been responsible for the state of mind you had when you made each of them. And so on all the way back to your initial state of mind which you can't be morally responsible for. I think that would be the wrong way of looking at it. It seems to me to set up the argument by distinguishing between the state of mind and the moral choice that is to be made, and then suggesting that the state of mind determines the choice. But that certainly isn't what I'm suggesting. I'm not denying that you will be influenced by what comes to mind. If, for example, a certain option didn't come to mind, then you wouldn't be able to will it. But I'm suggesting that what you will is known by God, and normally would enable you to indirectly influence what will come to mind. Rules permitting. To highlight the difference, imagine, for the sake of discussion, two different people experiencing having identical human forms and considering the same moral dilemma while experiencing the same mental state. That they are both faced with the choice of whether to give in to tiredness and go with the best course of action so far considered, or whether to continue considering the dilemma in the hope of coming up with a better answer. And with the argument you provided, reality seems to be being envisaged in such a way that they would both make the same choice. But with free will as I am imagining it, one could give in to tiredness, while the other could go on to consider the dilemma. That from that point, that they were in the same mental state, they were free to choose either option as their preference. And that difference regarding what reality is supposed to be like allows me to point out that what you are suggesting in your argument doesn't apply to the way I am imagining reality. And if you were to suggest that it is too much to expect that person could have the free will, such that a choice is not determined by a mental state, then it seems to me that you wouldn't be showing by any philosophical argument that free will or moral responsibility wasn't possible. You would have just have assumed your own conclusion, or in other words, have committed the fallacy of begging the question. Okay, let's just leave the issue of free will behind us. Because there are other issues for your account. One of which is the problem of evil. So for the listeners that aren't aware of it, it basically stems from the question of why, if God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and morally perfect, doesn't it put an end to evil? Some have suggested that this is more than just a puzzling question. They claim that the existence of evil shows us through reason that such a God doesn't exist. Their argument can be outlined as follows. If God exists, then God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and morally perfect. If God is all-powerful, then God has the power to eliminate all evil. If God is all-knowing, then God knows when evil exists. If God is morally perfect, then God has the desire to eliminate all evil. Evil exists. If evil exists and God exists, then either God doesn't have the power to eliminate all evil, or doesn't know when evil exists or doesn't have the desire to eliminate all evil. Therefore, God doesn't exist. So what have you got to say to that? Well, firstly, it seems to depict evil as though it is some kind of noun. But in my view, evil is a type of choice. When a person chooses to walk almost the opposite path to the loving, selfless path. With that in mind, I think the problem is with the sixth premise you mentioned. The one that suggested that if evil exists and God exists, then either... God doesn't have the power to eliminate all evil or doesn't know when evil exists or doesn't have the desire to eliminate all evil. What seems to be overlooked is that God could have the desire that beings didn't make evil choices, know when they do and have the power to stop them. But also, desire that all minds freely embrace the loving selfless path with their hearts, so to speak. It would be easy to imagine rooms that could be created where beings like us were given the experience of having forms with which no thoughts of performing evil actions ever came to mind. I imagine the rooms in heaven are like that. But if they were the only rooms God allowed for us, then it could have been claimed, by Satan for example, that we weren't free to leave the path, but were instead slaves to it. 
and that if we were given the choice would agree with it and reject the path. Thus a room like this makes sense. A room in which we are free to leave the loving selfless path. Such that if we embrace the loving selfless path in such a room and are given heaven afterwards, it cannot be said that we are like slaves to the path, because we would have embraced it in this room when we were free to reject it. So all beings like us go through this room? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. There are lots of possibilities. The point I was making is that the sixth premise has a value judgment in it. It suggests that in all circumstances, it is better to force beings into following the loving, selfless path than allowing them to choose whether to or not. God preferring to give beings the freedom to choose does not mean that God does not desire that they choose to follow the loving, selfless path. Well, you seem to have an answer for moral evil. But why would the room, as you call it, have things like wild fires and disease and things like that? Wouldn't they be unnecessary evils? I think the room is designed with the aim of it being unbiased, not tending towards good or evil. And as I mentioned, I wouldn't be surprised if the idea of the room was Satan's. And the evils in it could be argued to provide tests for people as to whether they would rather reject the loving, selfless path or not. In the book of Job, for example, there is the idea that Job has evils, as you seem to be calling them, inflicted upon him, to test his faith. Though the unnecessary evils, if you like, can also be considered a sign. That if the room is unbiased and God is a loving, selfless God, then being able to be burnt or tortured to death in this room is a feature that was desired by Satan. And if there is a symmetry, then not only will there be a heaven but also a hell. And what would the experience Satan was going to provide be expected to be like if in this unbiased room people could be burnt or tortured to death? I think it is particularly important for those that have gone out of their way to follow the hateful selfish path, for example. A path some gangs, for example, might encourage. Because while they might be thinking they are being smart, and that they simply have a clearer understanding of reality, if they understood the bigger picture, they would see how foolish it was. A bit like how the frog in the well in the story had thought it had understood reality, when really it had been living in ignorance of the bigger picture. As a side issue, while those evils you mentioned contribute towards this room potentially being quite tough, most people have the option of leaving the room if they don't like it. They could simply commit suicide. That most atheists don't suggests to me that they prefer the experience over no experience. I should mention that if someone capable of still doing good within the room committed suicide, it could be considered that they had chosen to leave the room when there could have been opportunities in the room to help others. Okay, well, let's move on to your arguments. Firstly, the issue you called the influence issue. Why couldn't the experience just be an emergent property such as pressure in physics? Sure, a particular instance of pressure could be explained in terms of more fundamental elements following the laws of physics, but there are laws of physics using the concept of pressure. How could it be said to not be influential when it appears in those physical laws as an influence? Firstly, in physics, emergent properties are thought of as being the logical consequence of the fundamental properties of the fundamental entities in the physics model. But experiencing isn't a logical consequence of any of the supposed fundamental properties in physics. And while it could be claimed that experiencing is the logical consequence of unknown properties at the fundamental level, they haven't even a speculative model for what those properties could be. And nor do I believe they will have, because the experience is based upon what has been agreed upon by God and Satan as being appropriate for what the brain state represents and thus wouldn't reduce to any fundamental properties of entities found in physics. And thus, like they would be unable to come up with a reductionist account for why a robot should experience a certain representation of its NAND gate arrangement, they won't be able to come up with a reductionist account of our experience. Secondly, experiencing unlike pressure is not a behavior. Thus, with the robot that claims it is experiencing, two people can agree upon its behavior, but still disagree over whether it is experiencing or not. Whether behavior is influential is a different question to whether a non-behavioral property influences behavior, and if so, how. As I said in our last discussion, I'm not trying to make an argument that there is no possible story in which reality is a physical one. Because you could, for example, have a story in which something physical was playing the role of God. In regards to your question, what I am pointing out is that not only aren't they able to offer even a speculative model of how they are suggesting 
that experiencing is an emergent property. But even if they could, they would still need to explain how the experience was an influence, because unlike pressure, it isn't a behavior. Well, okay. Let's move on to the fine-tuning of the influence issue. Are you aware that there is already an account in activism that explains the experience? Let me just give you a quote from Wikipedia about it. Inaction is the idea that organisms create their own experience through their actions. Organisms are not passive receivers of input from the environment, but are actors in the environment such that what they experience is shaped by how they act. What they experience is shaped by how they act. That they get the experience they do from how they interact with the environment. So then, is it really so surprising that humans interacting with their environment the way that they do should have the experience that they do? I am aware of those type of accounts, but the stories are very vague to say the least. Though I understand the rough perspective, I didn't cover it as I didn't want to go through all the stories put forward by philosophers, as there can be lots of different suggestions and to go through them might simply serve to muddy the waters for your listeners. But since you brought this one up, one of the leading proponents of inactivism is Evan Thompson, and in his 2010 book, Mind and Life, he outlines a key idea in inactivism, and that is that our mental lives involve our body and the world beyond the surface membrane of our organism, and therefore cannot be reduced simply to brain processes inside the head. And Thompson tried to make a defense against the philosopher John Searle's comment, that the brain is all we have for the purpose of representing the world to ourselves and everything we can use must be inside the brain. Each of our beliefs must be possible for a being who is a brain in a vat, because each of us precisely is a brain in a vat. The vat is the skull, and the messages coming in are ways of impacts on the nervous system. While Thompson in response denies that the brain is everything we have for the purpose of representing the world to ourselves, he does concede that he does presume that for every subjective and phenomenal change in one's conscious experience, there is a corresponding change in one's brain. But questions to what extent those changes are explicable without the context of where the messages come from, and goes on to state that it is a hypothesis of the inactive approach that unless these contexts do matter, the relation between experience and the brain would never be known. But that seems to me like an atheist clutching at a last straw. It is one thing for them to desperately want the context to matter, because they believe that if it didn't, the relationship between the experience and the brain would not be knowable. But the problem for their guess is that they don't have an explanation for how it does matter. Imagine two brains receiving identical signals in terms of the nerve signals to the brain and the blood composition, one being in a human and the other being in a vat. What difference would the inactivist be suggesting it would make to brain activity whether the brain was in a vat or not. If they aren't suggesting it would make any difference to the processing and only a difference to the experience, then there would be the influence issue, because they would be suggesting the experience would be different and yet aren't suggesting the processing would be. If they are suggesting that it would make a difference to the processing, then they should explain what they are suggesting in terms physicists could understand so that experiments could be done. As far as I'm aware, though, they haven't any suggestions which they feel plausible enough to share. Furthermore, as I understand it, people can have bionic eyes, where a chip is placed behind the retina. The chip is able to effectively send signals to the brain by stimulating the optic nerve. It seems obvious that the brain would not be able to distinguish whether the chip was generating the signals because of some light that it had detected, or whether it was just transmitting those same signals because it had been programmed to, or because they were broadcast to it and it seems possible to show that. So why do you think the academic world is so set against the idea of the existence of God? I think that would be a whole other conversation. One you're willing to have? Of course. Then until our next conversation. Thank you. And thank you, listeners. I hope you enjoyed the discussion, and will join us again for more Afternoon Chats.